Thank you. Um, so hi everyone. Welcome to my um, tiny apartment kitchen. Um, my name is Emily Bridges. I'm the registered dietitian here with Harvard Dining Services. Um, it's nice to meet everyone virtually. You likely have not seen me before just because I started in January, so I am relatively new to the position. Um, I uh, went to BU to get my master's in clinical nutrition, and then I um, spent some time in healthcare before I ended up here, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, besides loving nutrition, I also love food and food service, so I'm really happy to kind of combine the two of those things today. Um, my layout might look a little bit different than Akisha and Martin's, um, just in terms of the class structure, just because I wanted to spend some time at the beginning kind of introducing a few of the nutrition concepts that are relevant to the recipe that we're gonna be making today. Um, but I'm really open to feedback. So if there's something um, you wanna see or if there's a better format that you think um, would work, please do let me know. Um, I can give my email at the end of this. Um, so you're welcome to send me comments, suggestions, that kind of thing. Okay, um, so I wanted to start off um, with the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate. So um, the, the Healthy Eating Plate is Harvard's kind of spin on the USDA's uh, My Plate. You can actually go to the next slide. For a second. Oh, is it not? It's I not advancing. Okay. Maybe Sorry. it's just slow. Uh, technical difficulties. Of course. Um, I think you have to click enable editing so that you can um, go to the next slide. It looks like that's not clicked at the top. Hmm. Hmm. Let's do this way. All right. Okay. All right, so the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate is really just a spin on the USDA's My Plate that was introduced in 2011. Um, it's really just kind of a government guideline in terms of um, its education really for the public. And prior to that, you probably remember um, the super abstract um, food guide pyramid, which, um, you know, I had probably a lot of good intentions, but when you think about it, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense if you're thinking about building your plate or making something that's healthy. It's just, it's too abstract to kind of make it into anything that's um, really useful. So my, my plate was certainly an improvement in that sense and how the government kind of educated Americans on healthy eating. Um, but it's still like any government entity, it's not a perfect kind of um, thing. So Harvard expanded on the plate by actually specifying um, well, let me let me back up and explain what the my plate is in general is half of your plate being fruits and vegetables and then the other half being split between protein and grains so the usd usda my plate um, just kind of split it into the generic protein term and then the grain term and then what harvard did was actually specify it a little bit more and made it whole grains and also made it um, healthy lean eco-friendly proteins um, so um, no, I'm sorry. So again, it's really just, it's a really good visual, in my opinion. Um, it's a lot better than the, um, the pyramid food guide that we had in the 90s, just because it really gives you a kind of good um, sense of what your, your plate should look like when you are going to approach a meal. Um, and again, it's a suggestion. Um, I'm kind of, I'm not really a dietitian that's going to be too nitpicky on making sure you have everything in one meal, but it's more about your diet as a whole over a whole day or even a whole week. Um, it's really just a good guideline in terms of what you need to be thinking of. So again, we're going to go over uh, vegetables a little bit in another section, um, but it kind of breaks it down into the protein, which we will also go over in a little bit more depth, um, and then the whole grains, which on the next slide, yeah, I will explain. Um, so so the Harvard kind of specifies whole grains. So what is a whole grain? It's really just the grain seed that's comprised of all of the parts of the grain. So it's the endosperm, it's the bran, it's the germ. Refined grains are really stripped of the germ in the bran, leaving only the, the starchy endosperm um, component. And bran is that protective outer shell of the grain. So um, it has a lot of bulk to it. It gives you a lot of fiber, also has a lot of nutrients. 
Um, that's going to be really beneficial for your body as well as your microbiome, um, a whole bunch of things that we'll discuss in a little bit. And um, fiber as well will slow down that breakdown of the starchy component within the grain. So it kind of levels your blood sugar um, a little bit. It maintains your blood sugar at a more steady rate. Um, fiber can also prevent the formation of blood clots that can trigger heart attacks or strokes. Um, so there's a lot of, it also lowers cholesterol. So there's a lot of good benefits of a fiber that you get rid of when you get rid of the bran. The germ is actually the little, kind of the, the nucleus, the, um, the nutrient packed cell that's in that grain that's actually going to feed it when it's going to sprout. So it really makes me sad that they get rid of it when they refine a grain because you're getting rid of so much of the good fats, the good nutrients, everything um, in a grain that is going to be really, really beneficial, not only for the plant, but also for you. Um, they do tend to refine grains just because they're more shelf stable. So the, um, the germ has a lot of fat in it, so it will kind of make um, the flowers less, less shelf stable because the, the fat's going to oxidize a little bit more than just a refined, a refined grain. So when you're in the grocery store, um, food companies don't make it really easy to find a whole grain. Um, what you want to look for is the 100% whole grain label. That's kind of uh, above all what you want to look for because they're going to get really tricky with their marketing in terms of Okay, well, maybe it's multigrain. Well, multigrain doesn't mean much besides the fact that maybe it's made with a bunch of different types of grain. Um, maybe it's seeded, which really just means there's some seeds in it. Um, there could also be just a uh, verbiage around, um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, whole, so it said it might be made with whole grains. And that just means maybe there's a small fraction of it that's whole grains, but the rest of it is really just the refined grain. And USDA organic goes more into, um, how the grain was uh, raised as opposed to the nutrient components of the grain. Okay, next slide is on uh, protein. Quick, quick question, yeah. what part of the grain contains the gluten in grains that have gluten? It's the endosperm, so that's that starchy component um, that's within the grain. Okay. So then the next part is, I'm going to touch a little bit on protein, but actually in my next class, we're going to go more in depth on that. So I don't want to go um, too much into detail, but just for the, the sake of this presentation, um, just know that Harvard kind of emphasizes lean and eco-friendly sources of protein, um, reducing red meats, uh, reducing processed meats like sausages, um, and then cheese as well. And then emphasizing things like legumes, which are the star of our show today. So legumes are also called pulses in their dried forms. They're edible seeds or pods um, that grow from certain plants. So these include black beans, chickpeas, peas. Um, peanuts are a legume, they're not a nut. Um, and then our guide today, which is lentil. So they make a really good exchange for red meat because they contain many of the same nutrients, but they have fewer of the um, drawbacks. So one of the main advantages of legumes is that they don't contain much of the saturated fat that you'll find in a lot of um, animal products, including cheese, including dairy, including red meat. Because um, saturated fat and, and overall in high amounts um, can contribute to cardiovascular disease. So legumes are a really good source of protein without being uh, coupled with a lot of that saturated fat. So they're really great. And they're also packed with a lot of other nutrients that are um, super beneficial like folate, calcium, potassium, zinc, B vitamins, antioxidants, all these really good things I could just go on. And they contain lots of fiber, which again um, is correlated to a lot of um, protective factors for a, a number of different diseases, cardiovascular disease. And it actually provides food for the gut uh, bacteria that you have in your microbiomes, which contributes to a healthy gut that is also implicated in a number of different disease processes um, from obesity to mood regulation. It's a huge um, new area of research that's really exciting as I'm sure you all know. Um, so fiber is giving you those prebiotics that are actually gonna feed the bacteria that you already have in your gut. Um, so lentils are also, re also really cost, oh sorry, I skipped a little bit. Um, legumes are also really cost efficient. Um, you can get canned ones or dried ones. They're really one of the cheapest protein sources. Um, dried beans require soaking prior to making them um, fully digestible. So if you just cook a dried bean, you're going to have a whole lot of GI distress. Um, but the thing about lentils is that they don't need that extra.
crop gas emissions per area compared to other crops and they can actually sequester carbon and nitrogen in the soil which actually makes um, the soil itself um, so farmers will actually use Emily? Um, they're usually on a dried form, though you can find the canned variety. There's green ones, there's uh, brown ones, which typically like mushy ones or the red ones. So um, the the yellow and red ones you might want to use more for your curries because they do, or curries or like soups because they give you more of a creamy texture while the brown ones, which we'll be using today, um, as well as the green ones. Um, oh no, do you miss some? Uh, Emily, we're, um, um, I think we're all, Emily, can you hear me? Yeah. We're all experiencing a little bit of a delay. Um, I, I know that you. a storm just started here. Um, so can you go back and retell us about the lentils? Yeah, same here. Can you retell us about the lentils? I can indeed. Um, what part did you miss? <laughs> what part did you miss? Because I was on legumes for a while and then. Kind, kind of all of it. We heard the end oh, of the okay. beans. Okay. So, um, the end of beans. Okay. Um, so with lentils, they're a little bit of contrast to regular beans because you don't need to soak them prior to cooking them. I don't know if you missed that part, but lentils are super easy and versatile in that sense because you don't have to spend hours soaking them prior to making them. Because if you don't, um, for things like dried navy beans or black beans, you do have to soak them overnight or in heated water for a while in order to make them fully fully digestible because if you don't, you're, end up gonna, you're gonna end up with a lot of um, difficulties in digesting that, which is uh, you're not gonna have a good time. So lentils, you don't have to pre-soak or awesome in that sense. Um, again, they contain a lot of fiber. They contain a lot of nutrients that you won't get from um, meat sources. Um, and they are, in the grocery store, they're actually usually dried, but you can find them canned. And you might find green or brown ones, you might find yellow ones or red ones. Um, and they're actually, they, they cook a little bit differently. So the green and the brown ones um, will hold up a little bit more to cooking, while the yellow ones and the red ones tend to get a little bit more mushier and break down a little bit more. So you can use those in your curries or in your soups to give a really nice creamy texture. You can make dips. Um, while the uh, green and the brown ones, they will hold up more, so you can cook them a little bit. You can also um, saute them to make them crispy, so they're really good on salads. Um, lots of different kind of uses for them. And um, they make a really good meat substitute, which is what we're going to be cooking today. Um, so you can, we're going to be making meatballs today, but you can really use this batter in a lot of different ways. You can use it to make burgers. You can use it um, after you bake the meatballs. You can crumble it into you know, tacos or you can use it in a chili. Um, it's really great in that sense. Um, and let me make sure I didn't miss. Yeah, okay, so let's get on. Are there any questions about the nutrition component before I go to the cooking portion? Uh, not so far, but I'll keep track of, of the chat. So uh, to pan fry crispy lentils, do they need to be partially boiled first? Yes. Yes. Or you'll have very crunchy lentils. All right. All right. So, so um, as questions come up, I will field them and pass them along. So keep them coming. I'm just going to angle this. I don't know if it makes sense. All right. Um, Okay, so what we're going to get going 
Um, first is we're going to saute the shallots and the onions. So, and what I mean by a, sh a whole shallot, there's two bulbs, or you, there's sometimes there's more bulbs within the shallot. Um, but um, when I say one shallot, I mean the whole shallot, not just one bulb. So, uh, I've actually already diced a few of them here, as well as the garlic, too. Um, and I really just wanted, I know Martin already gave you a lot of good knife skills, uh, but with garlic, I know a lot of people have issues just with peeling it. So uh, usually a good little uh, way to easily get rid of the skin on the garlic is just to kind of, with the blade facing away from you, you just want to put your palm on the knife and then put the knife on the piece of garlic and just crush it, you know, give it some weight, give it a little hit, and then it'll pretty easily peel. And you don't have to kind of worry about uh, taking the time to really go through and do all of it. Okay, so I've heated up some olive oil in my skillet, and we'll go over a little bit of um, the different types of fats in another um, segment. But the healthy eating plate does emphasize um, fats that are high in monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. So um, as I mentioned before, saturated fats have a lot of negative implications in terms of cardiovascular function. So um, oils that are high in polyunsaturated fats, especially, but also monounsaturated fats, canola oil, um, olive oil, walnut oil, it's gonna give you all some good, um, good types of fats. So I'm just gonna put all of it into my pan here. I like to use a cast iron because it becomes non-stick after a while, so I don't have to worry about oiling it too much, which is always a plus. Um, and in this recipe, I did, um, I have it set for lentils that are already cooked. Um, I'm actually, I forgot about my lentils. I was cooling my lentils because I cooked them um, already. But if you are, maybe you want to do this later, you usually lentils have like a, I don't know, it's two, about two cups of lentils to the two third, uh, or sorry, two cups of water to the two third cup of dry lentils that I had in the recipe, um, which will make the amount of lentils that you need for this recipe. So I already have them prepared and I've cooled them off so that whenever I put them in the food processor, um, they don't burn my hands or like cook the egg in any kind of unsatisfactory way. Can you repeat that ratio so I can put it in the chat? Yes, so it's two cups of water to the two thirds cups of lentil that I have in the recipe. And you can also use, um, sorry, you can't see my face at all, vegetable stock, um, which also gives it just, it's just more flavor. So either way, I just use water because I'm too cheap to buy vegetable stock. But you can make your own as well. Also, I hope Akisha anything because I'm not. Oh, Emily, we're losing you again. Emily, can you hear us? I'm back, can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I closed my window because I don't know. All right, um, so I have my Shallots. Um, I don't know if you missed anything. Just a little Yeah, we we kind of missed the whole thing. So we heard you talking about um, cooling the lentils and processing them. Yeah. So I um, yeah, and you heard the ratio about the lentils to the water. So I just cooled my lentils because I don't want them to be hot when I put them in the food processor because it's going to burn your hands when you try to make them into meatballs. Um, but it's also going to cook your egg a little bit, which isn't going to be super yummy. Okay, so I have my lentils and my shallots um, 
done here. So half of that, you can see it, half of that is going to go into my marinara sauce and the other half is going to go into the meatballs. Um, I'm also working really well. This is my food processor, if you can see it. So I'm putting half of the lentils and the shallots into the food processor. Um, can you mash the, if you don't have a food processor, can you mash them by hand? Yes, before I got a food processor, so I'm a vegetarian. I also like spent um, quite a while as a broke college student in Boston. So I use lentils a lot. And um, before I got a food processor, I would just mash them after I cooked them pretty well. You do have to cook them a little bit more um, just so that they can mash easily. But yeah, you can easily do that. Um, so then I have, I have a little, so I have the garlic and the shallots. I'm going to add a little bit of, you can either, if you're vegan, you can use nutritional yeast, which is actually really great for vegans because it usually has B12, uh, which sometimes vegans can be deficient in. Um, but I actually added a little bit of Parmesan cheese to mine as well, because I do like the flavor of nutritional yeast, but I also like the flavor of Parmesan cheese. So is it a, an equal substitution of Parmesan, you know, in the recipe ratio, Parmesan to nutritional yeast? Yeah, I've done it both ways and it, um, it does work just as well. The cheese is obviously going to bind it a little bit more because it does melt unlike the um, nutritional yeast. But um, yeah, they're pretty equal substitution. So um, I'm also going to add an egg. For vegan, you can use uh, either a flax egg or a chia egg. So those are really just either um, flax mill or chia seed that's hydrated with water and set aside for a little bit and it acts just like a binder, like an egg would. Which I have the um, recipe for the flax egg, but you can use the same ratio for chia seeds as well. Um, egg, and then my spices. So I have some Italian spices as well as some fennel. Um, I like fennel because it has a good um, texture. Um, or not texture, flavor. And then I have um, breadcrumbs. So if you are gluten-free, you can use any kind of gluten-free flour, oat flour, almond flour. It'll do about the same thing, which is thicken it up a little bit. Um, okay. And then obviously I need to add my lentils. Ideally, you would have a larger food processor than myself. One of the one of the people on the chat notes that they are using um, energy egg replacer. Oh yeah, I've heard of those. I don't know what's I don't know what that's made of. Is it soy? Anyways, let me know if it works. I'm adding the tomato paste. Well, just a tablespoon. And then I, did I add everything? Yeah. I'm going to blend it up. It's made of tapioca starch. Oh, okay. See, but I, I'm actually pretty expensive though, too. So like the thing, the thing, I mean, chia can be expensive, but flax is, is not as expensive. So I find it to be just as useful. But. Okay. So I have my um, batter, or um, you know, I don't know what you call it, batter. Um, so I'm just gonna. You, you can use a tablespoon. Um, you can also test it a little bit. So if it's kind of a little bit sticky, you can add more breadcrumbs to it. But I actually will. Um, let me just. Make this. 
What? Uh, I actually roll them in a little bit of breadcrumb. You can also roll them in more cheese or nutritional yeast to kind of give them a coating and it makes them a little bit crispier, which is delicious. Um, so I have another, I'm going to put them into a cast iron to bake. This is the oven at 375. Um, Emily, question. Um, do you know anything about sprouting lentils? Do they need to be cooked once sprouted? I don't. I wish I had more information. I imagine cooking them would um, not allow them to grow, but uh, I'm not sure. I, I can't give you a good answer. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, you can see this. I got my lentil ball, and then I'm just, it's, I use a tablespoon again. If I have it in my hand, it's pretty, this one's pretty soft. I might add a little bit more breadcrumbs. See this? Making it into a little ball. And then I'm just putting it right onto my cast iron. Um, but you can use just a baking sheet with parchment paper. It works just as well. Gonna make a few of these. Don't be afraid to get messy. Yeah, so I think the good thing about this recipe is that you can so easily customize it to um, so many different diets, um, whether you're vegan, whether you have an allergy. Um, it's really kind of super flexible. Okay, I'm just gonna make a few because um, I have actually already made some ahead of time, but I will pop these in the oven. So these are gonna cook for probably 12 to 15 minutes. Um, you can rotate them about halfway through so they get kind of an even cookie. Um, and so we'll check on those in a little bit, but um, while you're doing that, you can just make your marinara sauce. So um, I like to keep it pretty simple. I'm sure there's so many chefs that are gonna be super angry at me for not making a really homemade marinara sauce, but um, this is really easy, really quick. Um, so in my recipe, I, I put half a can of diced tomatoes and I don't really know what I was thinking because I don't know who is just going to use a half a can of diced tomatoes. So just use the whole can um, and you can save it for later. Um, and then Martin shares with us that sprouting lentils, sprouting lentils neutralizes the phytic acid and increases the amount of B vitamins and minerals. But do you have to cook them? Great question. Um, so I'm just turning on my heat to about medium. Um, and for the lentils, if you're making them at home, again, um, bring it up to a boil, the water up to a boil with your lentils in it. Um, and then whenever it's up to a boil, cover it um, with the lid and then put it down to simmer and um, just let that cook for about 15 to 20 minutes. It's really pretty quick. It's not like you're um, average everyday bean. I'm also just adding some Italian seasoning. It's just um, what you might find in the grocery store. It's usually like basil, oregano, um, rosemary, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to add a little bit of that. So um, cooking sprouted lentils is the same as regular and you can also eat sprouted lentils raw. Okay, so but okay. I don't, I'm, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought the question was, do you need to cook them prior to sprouting, like to make them sprout? But maybe that wasn't the question. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, and so the tomatoes that I use are petite diced tomatoes. Um, if you like it really chunky, 
Um, you can use just regular diced tomatoes or you can just use um, like canned tomato sauce or just buy marinara sauce in a jar and put it out onto um, a pot and heat it up. That also works. I just add the tomato paste because it thickens it up a little bit um, and has an extra kind of sweet little kick there. Um, also, whenever you're buying, um, I think canned, you know, foods, you want to be kind of cognizant of the amount of sodium that's in them. Um, they, nowadays, they make plenty of reduced sodium or low sodium versions that you can buy. And then you can salt them yourself as much as you'd like. Um, because typically, in order to you know, keep them preserved, they do add a lot of salt to them. Um, it makes them tasty, but might not be the best for you if you eat a lot of canned goods. Um, but every once in a while, it's it's okay if you buy normal sodium canned goods. Um, and then I have frozen spinach, um, really simple. You can also use fresh, fresh spinach. It's about a third of a cup that I'm just going to add into the marinara sauce. Can you use other kinds of greens instead of spinach? You can use whatever you want. Um, you can use kale. I bet kale would be good. Um, you know, you could dice up some broccoli and add it to it. Use any kind of green that would be super yummy. Um, so then you just kind of let that simmer for a little bit. Um, the longer it simmers, the more flavor it's going to have just from um, sitting in all of the herbs. Um, and then once that's heated, you will just add it to your meatballs. Um, so I, you can make this with pasta, um, but I've actually just made it with some. Um, broiled eggplant. I really like eggplant. It's especially good when it's broiled. Um, so I just kind of have it as like a super veggie packed um, meal. And then you could just put your marinara sauce over your meatballs. Oops. Um, and can you see that? Yes. We can. That's, Beautiful. That's pretty much it. Um, you can see how they bake, they got nice and crispy and crunchy because I rolled them in the breadcrumbs prior to um, putting them in. But again, if you don't roll them, that's fine as well. They'll kind of come out if you want it. But... Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. What oh, I question? Forgot to add the... Oh, go, go I ahead. I forgot to add the other shallots and the onions to the marinara sauce. But... <laughs> you can add that in. It's already cooked. Yeah, you could just, you could put them on top, right? Yeah. Terrific. All right, folks, what questions do you have for Emily? If any. If any. Yeah, and if you have any suggestions for um, future nutrition topics you want me to cover in one of these classes, please do let me know. I can pretty much go down any avenue or rabbit hole that you want me to. <laughs> How much protein would you say is in um, is in uh, four meatballs? I, I believe when I looked at this, it was like ten grams of protein in four meatballs. Um, but you can always, if you want to up the protein, you could um, make it with a pasta that has, you know, they make the protein pasta nowadays that are made with like chickpeas or. Um, any pet, or like they even make the lentil pasta, so it could just be lentils on lentils, and you could up the protein in that way. Um, yeah. And how how many meatballs does the recipe make? Around twelve. I also and, made thirteen one time, so it depends. And are lentils a complete protein? So that's actually something we'll cover in the next. Um, in the next class, but they're not a complete protein. So in order to make a complete protein with plant protein, the formula that I like to say to people is legumes plus a grain, a nut, or a seed. So in order to make this a, well, it is a complete protein with the breadcrumbs in it because you have a grain in there, um, but, or you could have it um, with on a piece of bread, you could make like a meatball sub, and then you have that grain in there to make it a complete protein. It's just about mixing and matching to, to um, kind of get all of the essential amino acids in there. Um, but if you don't have a complete protein in one meal, like don't freak out. It's more about what your overall day looks like. So because you had a sandwich for breakfast that had grains in it, um, whenever you're eating the lentils later on, um, your body's going to utilize that and it's going to make 
it's going to give you all of the amino acids that you need, even though it's not in one meal. Uh, and someone asked if you would slice open a meatball so we can see the texture inside. Yeah. I'm going to put it on your other camera. I thought I was going to put it on your other camera. There we go. I can do it on this one. All right, back up just a little bit for us. Oh. Oh, Emily, we lost you. I'm still here. All right, I can hear you. I can't see you. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Sorry. Vidya shared that um, they used greens from their farm share that had been frozen last fall in the meat oh, awesome. recipe. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, freezing is such a great way to preserve vegetables, um, you know, for later use. You don't want to waste it. So freezing is great because it really gets them at their peak uh, ripeness. Yeah. Does uh, freezing, what does freezing do to the nutritional value? Really nothing. Um, so canned, can you will see a little bit of nutrient loss whenever you can foods, just because usually you heat them up, which tends to leach some of the nutrients. But freezing, depending on how you do it, if it's just like flash freezing, you really don't use any of the nutrients. So like, well, um, freezing, I think, is a better option. Um, and it's a great way if you, um, if something's out of season or, you know, it's a really uh, cost-effective way to, to get veggies into your diet without losing really any of the nutrients. So that's a recommendation for a future cooking topic. And the question yes. was, do the lentil meatballs freeze well? I can... We've lost you again, Emily. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that the lentil meatballs will freeze well if if you if you form them and then put them in a container and freeze them um, before you cook them. That should work all right. Emily says they can freeze for about I don't know a month what's going or on. two. Yeah. Well, the the weather is coming back in my neighborhood. So why don't we yeah. use that as our signal to sign off? Thank you. That was really wonderful, Emily. Great to be with you virtually. Yeah. Nice right. to see everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Akisha.